Okay, welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started here on time. Um, very excited to have you here in this session. My name is Lisa Janicki Hinchliff. I'm the coordinator for information literacy services and instruction at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I am also an affiliate faculty in our School of Information Sciences. And one of the things that I love about um, being at the University of Illinois and having a School of Information Sciences is the opportunity to work with graduate students on research projects. So I'm really pleased to introduce Jenny Brooksford and Paige Dine. Um, so if you are librarians, they're graduating soon. <laughs> um, this session is on discovering the library and the librarian in science textbooks, looking at representations and implications of this um, representation. Of, and it's not just the library and librarians, but also information literacy, the research process, all sorts of things. Um, I, for a long time, had wanted to really think about how do people hear about the library, not when we're up in front of them talking to them, but in ways that their curriculum sort of tells them about the library as part of the textbooks they read or what faculty say to them, because ultimately those are far more influential on forming their mindsets around the role of information in their discipline, in their studies, than anything that any librarian is ever going to say to them. So our goal for today is to identify um, like of these introductory science classes, where do we see the most potential then looking at these textbooks for fostering this faculty, staff, librarian relationships? Look at how they are represented in the textbooks so that we can look at ways that we might actually improve information literacy in science courses. Look about how we might improve the books themselves and we have some advice to authors, editors, publishers as well as librarians. And then look at how we can align scientific literacy with information literacy to sort of build this scientific information literacy among our college students who are, of course, the future scientists. Um, and so the messages that we send to them are really important. So we know also that this is important because information literacy is generally reported to be really quite desired by employers. So employers are looking for students to come out of college with the ability to find, use, and evaluate information in order to solve problems. This is well documented in a set of studies that is done by Hart Associates for the Association of American Colleges and Universities. They are very interested in transferable critical thinking skills. So how people can take things they learn in one environment and apply them to another. We also really want to look at the fact that science education has been roundly criticized for the, what we call the receivership model of education, where basically what it means to become learned or educated is to receive the knowledge of experts, as if, and, and never really understand then why we come to know these things. Like how did that stuff that's in the textbook, why did we decide that that's the truth, right? How did, how did that come about and how can you be part of that? And we particularly see this in the Boyer Commission on Undergraduate Education in Research Universities that really roundly criticize particularly research universities for this receivership model of the undergraduate education where undergraduate students are told what they need to know as opposed to it be invited into the conversation of inquiry and the process of developing new knowledge. So we wanted to go ahead and say, okay, how do we look at these textbooks? So of course we had to find textbooks <laughs> to look at. Um, we decided to take the sample by taking the introductory physics, chemistry, and biology classes in the Big Ten research universities, of which we are a part. And we then looked at the spring semester courses. We looked at the 100 and 200 level courses. Then we went to the bookstore website for those, those institutions and looked at all the assigned textbooks for those courses. So that's how we developed our sample of the textbooks that we looked at. Um, we then acquired those textbooks, which gave us great sympathy with students because acquiring textbooks was not easy to do to study them. Fortunately, we owned a fair number of them. We were able to get them from other libraries. Um, in one case, we drove across town to take a look at one at another university, and there's some that we were able to get through interlibrary loan, and then some that we just did not able to do. If we couldn't get the exact edition, we would try and get the most recent edition relative to that. We had to read the textbooks, <laughs> um, develop a coding protocol. So we looked primarily at the front matter and the introduction, 
the first and last chapter, and then we would look through the index and the glossary to see if there were any things where this seemed to be mentioned. Because we quickly saw that if they were going to talk about the inquiry process, they either did it at the beginning or the end, which is interesting in and of itself. And then, of course, there was coding, summarizing, writing descriptions, sort of the whole findings, because ultimately this is qualitative research. So um, we particularly looked at the Big Ten because of the high student enrollment that is across the Big Ten, um, the geographic reach of the Big Ten, and the diversity of the student body. I guess I already said some of this, yeah. didn't I? Yeah, that's, yep, yes, that's, that's I was okay. supposed to be clicking through and I didn't. <laughs> so let me just point out a few other things, that there were 75 textbooks. Um, we left out any course manuals, workbooks, web content, course packs, readers, like we were looking at those things that we would all say that's the textbook. Um, we also recorded all of this information, instructor name, et cetera, in case we ever wanted to go back to that data. There's a very detailed spreadsheet. <laughs> so we managed to get 74 of the 75 texts. Um, this was the reading procedure. I just really screwed this up, didn't I? You guys are like, why is she not clicking? <laughs> should totally Holy correct your advisor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are the concepts that we were coding for. Library, librarian, the concept of peer review, which we know is really important in science, was this introduced. The notions of what is primary literature, the notion of what is research, scientific literacy, scientific method, secondary literature, and then the other category because as you start to read all these textbooks, you start to just notice interesting things, and we wanted a place to be able to record that as well. Um, so coding was one column per concept. Um, where is this concept in the text? Pulling out direct quotations, and then writing those summaries that I mentioned. So the number one thing that would happen when I was describing this process to people as we were going through the research is people, we would say, like, we're looking to see if librarians, and li you know, how librarians and libraries are represented in college student science textbooks. And people would say, are they? <laughs> so the good news is the answer is yes. But of course, there's a more complicated answer as well. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jenny and Paige to do that. And I'll bring a handout back to the one person who just came in. There's some, oh, OK, if you didn't get a handout. All right, so let's start with libraries and librarians. So libraries are mentioned more than librarians, but really when libraries are mentioned, there are a lot of things that are mentioned that we don't mean. A gene library, a photo library, things like that. We didn't really want to talk very much about that. We were only talking about things that we also mean when we're talking about libraries. So what's great is if you have the handout, all of these findings are summarized on there. So we're going to actually spend a little bit more time in the presentation kind of talking about the quotes that go along with those, and then later we'll get to a couple case studies that we can also look at. So when libraries are mentioned, they're really just like spaces that hold materials. And that, that that's good, that's a start, but it's kind of a very basic definition of what a librarian or a library does and all the services it offers. Most of those aren't really mentioned at all. Librarians are kind of alluded to more than really mentioned. They have kind of their expertise kind of thing in a couple of ways, as we'll see in the quotes. And if there, there's something else that we don't really talk about, one of um, a supplementary material that talked about what librarians could offer students, but it's mostly just that they can teach you how to use a database, and then you don't need them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some quotes about libraries. This one from Biology Now is a really nice one because somebody goes to their local library and they find books and that helps inform them on a decision they're making about whether or not to vaccinate their children. So that's the kind of thing we really love to see. And the other two are a little bit more of kind of what we would see more generally. It's a place where there is reference material available or it's kind of something that helps aid in your learning, kind of like tutoring or other kind of student support services on a campus. So yes, a quote about librarians. A One librarian is thanked for her valuable reference work in the preface of one book. Yay! <laughs> And this actually, the second quote is more of a time when librarians explicitly could be recognized for their expertise and are instead ignored. This is talking about preservation and what to do to keep books safe. And they instead refer to the expertise of a paper chemist rather than the librarian. 
So, findings by theme of peer review. Peer review is mentioned a lot more than libraries and librarians. I'm sure that's not really a surprise to anyone. But um, it's mostly mentioned in the acknowledgement section. That's when people are really thanking the people who reviewed their book. So it's something that they value that people do for them, but not something that they bring up to their students as something that is a part of the process. When it is mentioned, it's talked about as something that upholds the integrity and high standards of science. Um, but in the best descriptions, it's used as something that mitigates bias and helps catch mistakes. So kind of more why they do it rather than just it is done. So some quotes about peer review. So we like when peer review is talked about, it helps kind of put science in a context. You have to communicate your results. You have to talk to other people. You can't just be in your laboratory and find something and then that's good enough on its own. So this first quote is talking about how experts check for methodology, design, and analysis. And then the next one talks about how that means that you might get very critical feedback on what you did. And that's a good thing because that helps to work on verifying your results. So, so yes. in talking about peer review, um, we know as librarians that there are different types of literature that scientists produce, right? Um, so we wanted to look at primary and secondary literature and see if they were talked about in aspects of peer review or as methods of discovering information. Because when students look at the textbook, a lot of students don't think beyond the textbook, right? That's the course material for their class, that's the canon, that's the literature that matters. But we know that people that are writing these texts are experienced in science, they know the process of science, right? They could become dis uh, dis like, um, enchanted, I guess, with the idea of uh, being a new learner, okay? So when we talked about primary literature, it was usually defined as scientific literature, which of course is a little misleading, right? Because review literature is also scientific literature, it's just not original research. So primary literature was um, also called original research as well as scientific literature. And it did go and show you where you could find primary literature, which is within those science journals. So it's doing some work there, right? Secondary literature, these were usually book-length works um, mentioned as secondary sources. So sometimes they did explicitly say that. Uh, they were mostly defined as review articles, textbooks, and popular magazines. Um, and that the secondary literature was helping you ground uh, yourself in the research. Okay. Some quotes about primary literature. Here we see um, we actually don't have a quote from a physics book. It doesn't mean that it didn't exist. Um, there were references to primary literature. We did look at that, but they didn't ever talk about it as a method of inquiry. Okay. So in Becker's Rule of the Cell, we see how uh, scientific literature is found in science journals, but it doesn't tell us where we find those science journals. It mentions the internet, but it says sites other than um, non-reviewed information on the internet, so where else would I find it, okay? Also this idea, um, scientific periodicals, students, that's a word that many students don't know, and if you look up periodical, it might tell you science journal, and then they might, you know, only think science journals, scientific literature, everything in a science journal is primary literature. So they talk about this idea of original research as having new ideas in reference to primary literature. When we get to secondary literature, um, the whole first quote's bolded because that's from a book that we really love called Biology Now, and we'll talk about that at the end. Um, but we see now we have no reference to chemistry. Chemistry didn't really talk about this idea of secondary literature um, explicitly in the text. So we love this first quote because it mentions the library as a place of discovery and where you can find this literature. We also like that it lists specific publication titles like National Geographic, and then it gets towards an evaluative statement, right? These are good sources. Now, it doesn't tell us why, okay? But it's this, this idea that there is some value in different types of information. In the second quote, we see that people who maybe look at textbooks or go to review sources um, maybe don't always behave like scientists, which is interesting. That has something to do with how um, research is done, which is what we'll talk about next. But this does address authority in the way that textbook authors still do have authority to talk about um, their research, even though it's a secondary source. So when we look at other findings by theme, we had research in the scientific method. And they're inextricably linked. We can't remove them from each other, OK? These processes are so tied together in science textbooks that you can't have one without the other. Um, Research is about asking the right questions. There are no, there's right and wrong in science. You have to be able to know what the right is and what the wrong is, okay? 
It's about observation and inquiry and asking those questions. The scientific method then incorporates that idea of research. It embodies all of research. Um, we like that it was mentioned as an iterative process, but only certain steps in the scientific method were iterative. So the idea of experimentation, observation, hypothesis, those were iterative steps you could always come back to um, in the text. But maybe not the idea of communication. You know, you'd go and talk to somebody about your hypothesis and then you'd have to go back into the literature. Those steps weren't mentioned, okay? So when we think about quotes, right? In physics, we see if something doesn't verify our predictions, then the theory or law is wrong. That gets back to that idea of there is right and wrong, black and white in science, right? Um, we see then at the, the bottom quote here, it talks about science as a social discipline, how you can communicate your results in different ways, and they report their most recent work to the scientific community. So it's this idea that we see that there's polarity happening even between the sciences, even though they're using the same scientific method. That's something that's important. We saw the same scientific method illustrated through a lot of these textbooks um, in different disciplines, but they think about research differently. Okay, um, so we like the idea of process, this social discipline, this process, and this idea of proposing, testing, and refining ideas more than a body of knowledge that's just right or wrong. So our last theme that we examined was science literacy. And we wanted to break this down into physics, chemistry, and biology because they do operate very differently, even though they're using some of the same material. So even though we talked about them holistically, we thought that science literacy was really actually getting at the idea of information literacy. It just wasn't going maybe far enough, okay? So we define science literacy as the ability to evaluate information in a science context. So being able to evaluate an experimentation, a method, et cetera, found in science information. And then using that information in practice or communication in your everyday life or as a scientist. And then we use the definition of information literacy from ALA, which is re recognizing information need and knowing how to locate, evaluate, and use that information properly for your information need. So when we think about this, we want to really think about science literacy as information literacy because they're doing so much together that they have the same mission. So most physics textbooks, they didn't expl explicitly mention scientific literacy. Instead, they had this idea of thinking like scientists. So it's a frame of mind, right? And when you practice information literacy, that's also a frame of mind, a way of thinking of something. So it's outlining specific processes as the scientific method. And it really, since physics is more mathematical science, it was really focusing on proper units and measurements. But we still didn't get this idea of a critical thinking for transfer. You're going to need to know and understand how these equations work so you can do it again over and over. Not just because you know this number goes here, this variable goes there, etc. When we look at chemistry, chemistry meant that you had to be able to do something in order to know it. Okay? So this idea of scientific naming and measuring, as well as science is a transferable process. If you can do this, you can do science elsewhere. Um, science literacy is only learned by practicing chemistry, so the act of doing, right? You can't just read about it, you have to do it. Um, and then it also really kind of tied into the idea of bias. So we also liked that because it's this idea that scientists could get too close to their work and then view what they wanted to see versus what was actually there. Or the idea that science that is funded by particular grants or governments may have a certain objective or motive. So we really like that idea that chemistry brought that out in the process of science literacy. And then lastly, we talk about biology. Um, biology is an observational science mostly. So it really talked about the important aspects of questioning and thinking critically about the literature and the science that you're doing and consuming um, through reading, okay? So it asks students to question the literature, to not stop at the literature. Um, it also used concrete examples that a lot of students um, experience in their everyday life. Biology is one of those classes that a lot of students have to take. So in order to make it relevant to them, they would use things about the environment and real world technology to tie uh, science concepts to students. And then lastly, they were really interested in determining fact from fiction. So science literacy as info lit in biology was really talking about the differences between real science and pseudoscience. When we look about at the specific examples from the text, okay, we look at how transfer is really important again. This idea that science goes beyond um, not just science, but everyday life skills that you're going to use in your life, okay. 
Um, then again, we get evaluating scientific claims that constantly bombard you. So this idea of information overload also applies to the sciences. So it's something you need to be prepped with and prepared to evaluate, um, disseminate properly. Okay, and the idea of a science is a social responsibility of everyone. Information literacy is a social responsibility of everyone. So this idea that when you, even as a common everyday person who doesn't practice science, you're gonna find news and articles relating to science, and we want you to find those interesting rather than intimidating, okay? All right, so now we're gonna look at three different textbooks. Okay, good, that's not too tiny, probably still not quite readable, but I'll try and tell you <laughs> what is great about this quote. So, and this is the physics of everyday phenomenon, and what's nice about that is it starts saying that how science is usually talked about is just the results, just the findings, not how we got there, not who did the work, and oh, it's my other one. Um, yeah, building off the work of others so that we don't repeat their errors and the things that they don't do well. One of the ways that it taught students to think critically was with little call-out boxes like that on debatable issues. So this is saying lots of scientists agree about what they think is causing climate change. Does the fact that a bunch of scientists agree about what causes climate change mean that that is what is causing climate change? And it asks students to really think critically about that. Um, as Paige mentioned before, one of the other things they try to do is focus um, physics on everyday things that people run into, like getting their blood pressure taken and saying, that involves physics. And physics is not something that's intimidating that you can't understand. You can't understand what's happening when your blood pressure is being taken. And then this is the iterative cycle of research. As we see, this is kind of what we were talking about. It's not necessarily complete. It's talking about hypothesis or theory, generalization, and observation and experiments, but not necessarily the communication part, which we think is really important. And then this is Biology Now, the book that Paige and I were talking about. We could have filled the whole slideshow with quotes from Biology Now, but we tried to only do two slides. Um, but it's a great book. One of the authors is actually a science journalist, so she brings that communication element in really well. And that was definitely a different idea for us. I don't think a lot of the other writers of our textbooks were in science communication in that way. So you can see there that one of the chapters that they have that has to do with science literacy explicitly uses that word as a goal. It involves informed decisions, knowing the difference between primary and secondary literature, basic and applied research, and knowing how to evaluate whether or not something is real science. And so it also tries to tell you what science is and teaches you kind of the mindsets and the skills that are involved with being a scientist, and that it involves communication with others to verify what is and isn't true. So kind of like we saw with the other textbook, there are a lot of questions that ask students to think for themselves. What would be the way that you would test this if you were doing it yourself? What were some of the things that are the cause and effect in this? And those were littered all throughout the book. And that doesn't even actually show the figure that was above it that went with it. Um, and again, this book is really based on inquiry and asking questions, and you could see that all throughout the book. And it also wanted to highlight the people who did the research, so it would have these little drawings and little bios of people when it mentioned their research, and that was just a really simple thing that the books did to really humanize who it is that you're actually learning from. And then there was a nice infographic about evaluating scientific claims, so those were some of the things that might make of research more and less credible. The credentials, potential biases and agendas, peer review and publication, and then, yeah, thinking about if it's real or pseudoscience after considering those other things. And then our last one is conceptual chemistry. It also used these call-out boxes and focused on the theme of inquiry. That's what the little FYI box is. And then below that talks about being skeptical, and that's another one of those mindset principles. What it means to be a scientist is to observe things and to come up with explanations, but to be skeptical of what we come up with and not just believe the first thing that we think. We really loved this wheel of scientific inquiry, again, having broad questions in the middle, but this one actually does focus on observation, on communication, documentation, reflection, a lot of those things that we saw weren't mentioned in other books. And then a way that they chose to deal with the idea of pseudoscience is they just had one page in the middle of a chapter. 
it wasn't really related to the other content around it necessarily, but if the professor wanted to teach pseudoscience, that was a way that they at least had a page in the text to do that. And so when we think about the implications of all of these um, findings that we found in these textbooks and the best case uses, we have to think about our duty as librarians, if you're a librarian, um, and how you can better reach out to your faculty members and talk with them about the sources that they're using in their classrooms. So this is an opportunity to talk with science professors and bring back this information that you now know, right? Um, evaluate the course materials, help them choose, if possible, um, what textbooks they can bring into their classroom or recommend other sources that they can assign um, through the library even that can help them deal with uh, their students deal with this idea of peer review primary and secondary literature etc um, information literacy just like scientific literacy it's a responsibility of everyone that includes you as a librarian so knowing the idea that um, science and information literacy go through these about you know it deals with evaluation critical thinking transferable skills that's important that's something that we should own um, again, we also would love to be mentioned in textbooks, right? <laughs> Give the librarians some love, but as well as libraries. Libraries are not just places where that hold information, but we need to contextualize those as places of scientific research as well, and that's where discovery can happen, and librarians can be part of that discovery and those services. And then lastly, um, say you can't talk directly with your faculty members or they have a publisher agreement, whatever, you authors of these textbooks, they usually invite feedback in the preface. A lot of students are not assigned the preface. I don't know if I've ever read a preface or an acknowledgement <laughs> section prior to where some of these ideas are mentioned, but they do offer feedback. Write a form letter, submit a form letter, say, hey, um, you could add an appendix for this. And we do have a checklist that you can go through and evaluate a science textbook yourself um, that the faculty are using or your school has that we'll share with you later. Yes, and so we also wanted to take advantage of the audience we have at Charleston, publishers and editors as well. And so we wanted to make sure that textbooks do other things, like they cite the things that they got their information from, just so students understand that a textbook isn't the be all, end all, only thing you ever need to know. It comes from somewhere and put it into context. Also, scientifically literate, lifelong learners are your future customers. So that is yet another reason why this is so important and providing guidance to authors on the principles of the checklist that we're gonna talk about later. It's on the back of your handout if you wanna sneak a peek. Um, if a textbook doesn't incorporate information literacy in the content, consider an appendix like Paige suggested. That's just an easy thing. You don't have to change your whole textbook to have chapters on it. If you want to, that's great. We'll <laughs> give you some guidance on that too, but <laughs> well, realistic goals, I guess. Um, so yes, and then also mentioning libraries and librarians again, like we said, as helpful parts of the scientific process. So I'm going to start with a little bit of our science and information literacy checklist, and then Paige will help finish it up. So the first principle is the scientific method is written as an iterative social process that incorporates the social aspects of science as well as inquiry as a method of discovery. This is my favorite example I use it when I'm telling people about this research all the time. The way that the scientific method is written about, it's kind of like a lot of times you're Isaac Newton, you're sitting under a tree and an apple fell on your head and you spontaneously discovered something amazing. And that's just really not necessarily how science happens you are reading and relying and learning from others, and that's just something that we really want to get across to students. The second thing is that science and information literacy should be explicitly mentioned and defined, and they should be learning objectives for the textbooks and for the class, because students need to not just gain all of this information, the receivership model, they need to be empowered citizens who can at least go out and make informed decisions about the science information they interact with in everyday life, or go on to produce great science if that's what they want to do with their lives. Yeah, and then in the field of science, you know, we know that physics, chemistry, and biology, they're very different. They do have different approaches, but they're still using the same concepts of the science literacy, the scientific method. So we need to make sure that we're still identifying that um, the social process of science. It's going beyond experimentation. Experimentation is certainly part of it. We cannot separate experimentation from science. But we also need to know that we need to communicate that experimentation. Who, how do they find out about the experiments? If nobody wrote or presented about it or got that information outside of a textbook, you know, where does it exist? Students need to be able to find who to talk to about that information. 
again, we are going to stand up here as proud future librarians to be <laughs> and say that libraries and librarians need to be part of the textbook narrative. Okay, um, science does not happen in a bubble. Um, it would be, you know, and we just we just want to pop the bubble, right? <laughs> so we want people to know that there are other people outside of um, science that are doing research as well and can help with that research process. And then lastly, as I said before, they sh should reference and cite primary and secondary literature throughout the work or at the end of their chapters. Give students a jumping off point. Give them a citation at the end of the chapter where they can go to the library with that information, ask somebody to help them find it. Know that the textbook is not the end all be all. Oh, we're done. Okay. The well. end all be all <laughs> for the scientific canon. Somebody had to take information that's been passed down through years of science, right, and write it up into a textbook format. They're not just doing that off the top of their heads, they've done this too. So it's kind of also a practice what you pre preach method. So at this time, if anybody has questions or comments, we'd like to invite those. Um, anything? Yeah, thank you. For yeah, thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> um, going back to you guys looking at um, the terms library and librarian in your textbooks, I'm curious if you looked into who the authors were and if they were active faculty to see if that maybe played a role in the why the literature was kind of underwhelming in that area? Yeah, that's not something that we looked at, but that is part of the reason why we recorded all of that stuff in our spreadsheet, so that would be an interesting thing to go back and look at in the future. Um, a lot of the author information was also located in the premise, the premise, the pref well, the premise of the book, the preface of the book, so um, a lot of them were esteemed researchers already in the field, but then... But were they researchers in the field, or were they teaching faculty? So, that, and or both. Yeah. Right. So, um, but it's the idea that even they need help sometimes. So, so I'm just curious. Can you say a little bit more? Like, your what is your theory that makes you ask that question? I just like, feel you feel like because the reason I'm asking that is there's essentially no mention. Like, like yeah. I mean, the mentions are so peripheral and so fleeting. Right. That I'm not sure what we would like be correlating with. Like, well, with the with teaching faculty, they mm -hmm. they know the struggles of the students and they know. Mm -hmm. I think a little more intimately that um, help is found in the library and they're able okay. to translate that a little bit better than someone who is so experienced with doing research mm -hmm. that they don't even like consider the library or like like it's just an automatic like time or shoot so you know you yeah. just go to this database and you find all the things you need to find. Yeah. I guess yeah relating to that some of the textbooks would talk about how the book has gone through different editions and I think what we found more than necessarily like who the people were that wrote the books but the people that responded to the feedback from students and professors who used that textbook tended to include more of the concepts that we're talking about. Yes. Exactly. I, I think if you're going to do something like that with teaching faculty, I'm at a, uh, uh, a high research institute, we've got a medical school on campus, it's <coughs> our teaching faculty are still not necessarily going to in the sciences the hard sciences because we have the medical school sitting on the other end of campus. Even our physicists and our you know biologists on the academic side of campus still do not necessarily believe or include the librarian in the discussion because they already know what the research is and they're already doing it. So I think if you're going to talk about whether or not they're faculty, where they are, you also need to look at the um, the, uh, the, the dynamic or the, the characteristics of the institution because I think that, has a, that, that plays a large role. And for us, on our campus, you know, whether it's our health sciences librarians or our academic, we, uh, we face that challenge every day. And, and, and it's, it's interesting some of the conversations you have with folks because their response is, oh, well, I tell my students they can get it you know, through Google yeah. or something like that. And yet these are practicing researchers, they're getting, you know, significant amount of grants or they're they're well qualified in their field. They just they don't necessarily connect the dots. And I yeah. think because of where they are and what they're doing, and they're practicing faculty and they're they're on the academic side, but it's the nature of the institution and who they interact with. I wonder if, it'd be, if the findings would be any different for open access textbooks. 
So we actually reviewed several open okay. access textbooks. Um, the title that most people are familiar with is the OpenStax textbook company. Um, and they did actually make a, a lot more um, connections to information literacy. A lot of them had like writing prompts based around information literacy or the idea that you go out and do research about um, one was like uh, copper had killed a king and the poisonous properties of copper go and investigate that as a researcher and see you know what the amount of copper or what he ingested could have why it was legal and such like that um, also the open the open sex books in particular um, mentioned ideas of science literacy and information literacy yeah i think in peer review in peer review yeah, yeah. So some of this would also be, I think, looking at, I mean, additional things one can look at, right? Yeah. It'd be when the text was originally written, because some of these textbooks are in their, like, 13th edition. Right. And so, I mean, we all know that it's unlikely that the 13th edition was totally rewritten from the 12th, from this, right? So, and most OpenStax textbooks were written within the last couple of years, right? So some of this could also be, like, yes. when, does, when does the approach sort of in the book itself get codified or... or, or um, like sort of the basics of how we're going to approach teaching this topic. So, so just building on that, I think um, the point made back here, um, did you guys uh, talk to any uh, faculty or, or reach out to any of the authors and sort of you know, share some of this data and post some of the questions about you know, why this gap might be there? Did you, did you do any, um, has there been any qualitative to go with this based on the, the research that you had here yet? Um, we really wanted to present this here first and then we were actually thinking about moving ahead with a form letter but I actually speak from experience because I have a science education background and this is something that I identified not being taught in undergraduate classrooms but um, talking to specific faculty members or authors not yet yeah Melanie I don't know a lot about the open um, education resources but would this be an opportunity to I mean even crowdsource an appendix they could be made available and then textbook publishers not only would you be sending them a form letter that says you should consider doing this but here's this great resource we've already created for just you. use this <laughs> <laughs> why don't you just stick this in your book <laughs> wow that's nice <laughs> so i think for me like so i had this idea in a folder since um about 2001 that i wanted to look at textbooks because if you're a practicing librarian, you have the experience of the junior, senior, or even entry-level grad student who comes to the library is like, I wish somebody had told me about what a library could offer to me. And so I think we, as librarians, do a lot of work to try and get into the classes to talk to them. But I was trying to think of like, what are the other things that a student is encountering that is sending them messages, and are those the messages that we want sent? And I'm. Primarily, my experience is as a social scientist. That's where my background is. And I would often, in my social sciences texts, read a description of the library or the research process and be like, no! <laughs> right, as a trained librarian, and, and um, like I have a whole set of, like, so I let them pick where they wanted to focus, and they wanted to focus on science texts. But I actually would really love to do the writing handbooks because if you know anything about writing handbooks, they often talk about the research process. And I can't tell you how many of them say things like, well, you'll find that the library's collections are rather old, yes. so you'll want to go online. Yeah. As if online is not, I mean, like there's these very, and so that is going to shape a student's expectations of the library. And even if we then come into the classroom, their expectation is already shaped. So this is partially why I wanted to kind of roll back and say, like, what if they never saw a library and what would their experience be? And in the sciences, the experience would be the library and librarians essentially don't exist. So not a surprise then that their juniors and seniors coming into the library and saying, I never knew this existed. So I think it's this is in some way sort of the evidence of something that we all knew intuitively, but now we have data, right? So that, that process of research of going from a hypothesis of I think this is what's happening to Let's read 75 textbooks. <laughs> so. But don't catch librarians lung. We learned about that. Oh, that's true. That was another mention. I should have so. said that. Librarians lung. That is a, it's a disease. It's a disease. From smelling old books. Um, yeah. So they named something after us. <laughs> well, thank you so much for yeah, being here. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs>
references. <laughs> <laughs>